Let's talk now to Sir David King, who served as the government's permanent special representative for climate change between 2013 and 2017. Good morning to you, Sir David. Uh, I would like to just start off with how important it is that the Prime Minister attend COP27. Well, I think it's critically important that uh, all heads of governments attend these COP meetings. Um, let, let me just quote, if I may, from what Antonio Guterres has said uh, in opening the whole thing. He said, there is no way we can avoid a catastrophic situa situation if the developed and developing world are not able to establish a historical pact because at the present level, we will be doomed. Now, I don't think that's an over overstatement. I think the climate science is right behind what he's saying. If we want a manageable future for humanity, we must see that we all pull together to create that manageable future. What does, a, what does an historical pact look like, um, in your view? Oh, the historical pact would be to ratify the agreement made back in 2010. First of all, $100 billion a year was promised then to go from the developed to the developing world to help them to manage the impacts of climate change and also to help them to switch across to non-fossil fuel technologies. Uh, so far to date, the highest level that's come through is $21 billion. So we've, we've failed on that dr dramatically and at COP26 this failure became a big part of what was the, the the real loss of trust between the developing countries and the developed countries. But secondly, the uh, developing countries need the assistance of the developed world, yes, but the developed world needs to lead the way on deep and rapid emissions reduction. At the moment, we are way behind where we ought to be. Not one country is doing nearly enough. Uh, the Climate Crisis Advisory Group that I chair is producing four country reports on the key countries in the debate at the moment. And not one of those countries uh, is doing nearly enough. So I think the point I'm making is, if we want a manageable future for humanity, which surely we do, we need to understand the nature of the crisis we're in. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. First off, I wonder if I could just go back one stage. Why are we not doing enough? We're not doing enough for various reasons. One is we have failed to have since 1992 leadership from the United States. And the United States is normally the country we, we would all turn to for leadership on an issue like this. Why has the United States failed the world? The power of the fossil fuel lobby. It's as simple as that. We all know how powerful the lobby systems are in the US democratic system, um, the gun lobby and so on. And the most powerful lobby of all is the fossil fuel lobby. And senators and congressmen are really virtually and re in reality in the pockets of these lobbies. So I think we, we have failed to get that sort of leadership. Britain provided leadership under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, very open leadership uh, and, uh, from 1997 until about 2010. And then subsequently under David Cameron and Theresa May, we continued the good work that was begun. But since then, we have been slipping back and we're talking now the absurdity of opening up new oil and gas wells in the North Sea. Absurd because this does nothing to do with the crisis in the Ukraine. It would take at least 10 years before any new oil or gas reached the marketplace. And uh, therefore, since the war in Ukraine is sure to be over by then, we will be left saddled with an investment that will not produce results. So I think what, what we see is this sudden return to looking for more coal, oil and gas uh, around the world. It's not just Britain. Um, so, so David, excuse me if, if I come across as, as rude, but we seem to be hearing the same thing over and over again. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any real progress. I'm afraid you're right. You're not being rude at all. 
and nor is Guterres being rude. We, we have failed to respond. We, just let's remember, since 1992, we've been discussing at COP meetings progress on managing this uh, climate change disaster. Now, at first, it wasn't a disaster, and if we'd have operated quickly and got in place everything we needed to by 2000, we would not be in the straits we're in now. So 2015, we finally reached an agreement in Paris, and that agreement said we must stay below 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level, as you were saying. But what are the chances of that today? Well, we're now at over 1.3 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level, and we're rapidly approaching the 1.5. And the reason is emissions are still increasing year on year. So, no, not oh. enough companies have taken it seriously, and we're lacking political leadership on the issue. Uh, so, David, let's just very quickly touch on what used to be recalled, or what used to be referred to as reparations, but now we, we say uh, loss and damage. Is that realistic moving forward? I mean, can developed nations afford it? Yeah, the question: Can developed nations afford it? Could developed nations afford to fight off the COVID outbreak? I think we spent about thirteen trillion dollars on doing that. There is money in the system. And the, the question is, how do we release that money so that it can be used in the right way? Should we deal with loss and damage in developing countries? Should we help island states that are getting swept over by the oceans? Should we help those countries that cannot help themselves and that did not cause the problem? The whole of Africa is producing about 4% of global carbon dioxide emissions today, and yet Africa is suffering from these terrible impacts of climate change. Pakistan, as you mentioned, all around the world, extreme weather events are impacting on us. We know from our loss and damage caused that is paid for by the insurance and reinsurance industry that we're talking about quite possibly half a trillion dollars over the last three years, big sums of money. So yes, we need to invest large sums of money to manage the problem. And loss and damage in the developing world due to our actions in the past and today means our responsibility is to help those countries. And yes, I mean, for example, Britain is the sixth wealthiest country in the world. To me, it seems absurd to talk about us not being able to afford these things. OK. Sir David King, Special Representative for Climate Change, um, thank you very much uh, for, for joining us here on BBC News. Thank you. I suppose the question, as Sir David said, is how do you release the money? Now, don't forget...